Lecture 30, The Thermidorian Reaction. How do you rescue the Republic after the terror? This question was on everyone's minds after Thermidor and the fall of Robespierre. The revolution doesn't end with Robespierre. Instead, it continues on for five more years from 1794 to 1799. This lecture will focus on the roughly 15 months in 1794-95 after Robespierre's fall. This period is often called the Thermidorian Reaction because many revolutionary leaders reacted strongly against Jacobin policies. Politics lurched to the right. This lecture will ask, how does that shift to the right take place? Who is reacting against the radical politics of the Jacobins and how? But thinking about Thermidor only as a reaction or a backlash doesn't quite capture the whole story. The Thermidorians also wanted to somehow rescue the revolution. They didn't just want to deny it, and they certainly didn't want to go back to the old regime. It sounds kind of far-fetched, but try this metaphor. The Thermidorians are like gymnasts on a balance beam, the narrow balance beam of the Republic. In this lecture, they are running from the terror on the left, and they are leaning hard to the right, but they don't want to fall all the way off into royalism. So we have a crucial second set of questions for this lecture. How can the Thermidorians rescue the Republic and create a stable social order? Can they find a moderate path, a way to stay on the balance beam of the Republic, a way to end the revolution without destroying it? Let's look first at the Thermidorian reaction in the social and political world of Paris. The deputies who'd been elected back in 1792, they're still running the convention. But what's happening outside the convention? Soon after the fall of Robespierre, the high society of Paris began to dance. A lot of them also went to the theater and opera, but above all, they danced. Paris was swept up in a swirling, whirling, cathartic mania. The fancy people of Paris were dancing everywhere, in the dance halls, at the Carmelite convent, outside in the parks. People even waltzed in the cemeteries on top of the tombstones. And according to some stories, People who'd lost a family member to the guillotine had special dances called victims' balls. In these macabre parties, people let loose. They laughed in the face of the guillotine in a bizarre frenzy of collective mourning. The women wore red ribbons around their necks, and the men, they cut their hair short in the back. They pretended to be ready for the guillotine. But as we'll see, not everyone was dancing. Specific groups of individuals took part in this mood of release, this sudden hilarity and rejoicing in Paris. And like everything else in the revolution, it was tied to politics. And in this case, it had an ugly edge. So who was dancing? The dance leaders were young men called the Gilded Youth. They were the sons of the bourgeoisie. These men were shopkeepers, government clerks, and bank employees. Quite a few of them were draft dodgers. And they hated the sans culottes and the Jacobins. They came from a different social class than the sans culottes, and they had conservative reactionary politics. They wanted to show their scorn for the revolution in their very clothes. They rejected the rough style of the sans culottes. Instead, the gilded youth dressed flamboyantly like dandies, they wore pointed shoes and big felt hats and huge cravats. They had bizarre bouffant hairdos and tight knee breeches. They wore short jackets with big triangular lapels, and maybe they had 17 pearl buttons in honor of little Louis XVII, as they called him, the son of the king, still in prison. And the gilded youth went around Paris with female sidekicks, women who were called the merveilleuses or the marvelous ones. These women wore light, high-waisted gowns made out of gauzy fabrics or light muslin. And blonde wigs became a craze. In fact, when the noblewoman, Lucie de la Tour du Pin, when she came back from exile in upstate New York, a wig maker wanted to buy her hair. It was blonde and beautiful. 
and he told her he'd give her 200 francs if she'd only agree to cut it off. She refused. It had become the fashion to be decadent. Now, this Thermidorian world of sumptuous living was not just about fashion. The gilded youth dressed like dandies, but they walked the streets carrying big sticks. Here's the key point. They became the shock troops of the anti-Jacobin Thermidorian reaction. They dominated the streets, the cafes, the theaters. They harassed Jacobins and former militants from the sections. In some neighborhoods, the gilded youth took over the sections. They intimidated cafe owners who served militants. They stormed into theaters and forced actors to join them by singing a reactionary song that called for bloody revenge on Jacobins. And the gilded youth went around smashing revolutionary symbols all across Paris. Above all, they tried to find images of Marat, the friend of the people, the martyr of the sans-culotte. He was sacred to the people. So the gilded youth smashed statues of him everywhere, in the streets, the theaters, and the section meeting halls. In one Paris square, they destroyed a special display that included Marat's writing desk and his bathtub. And most sacrilegious of all, the gilded youth dug up the remains of Marat out of the Pantheon. The Pantheon was the civic mausoleum of Republican heroes. So the gilded youth tossed his bones into a common grave. They succeeded in intimidating the sans -culottes. Here's what one police agent recorded. The people seem to have something to say, but are afraid to speak. Now, the gilded youth weren't acting just on their own. In fact, newly conservative Thermidorian leaders in the convention had tight links with these young men. They often directed their actions behind the scenes because the leading Thermidorians wanted to knock the air out of popular politics. Prominent Thermidorian leaders also moved in this new social world of luxury and sumptuous decadence. They lived high on the hog. They rejected the egalitarian populist politics of the Jacobins. Take Jean Talien, that Thermidorian ex-terrorist. Take him as an example. His Spanish wife, Teresia Cabarrus, ran a salon that stood at the very center of the Thermidorian world of high living. During the terror, this beautiful young woman had been Talien's mistress in Bordeaux. She had just divorced her emigre husband, a French marquis. She wound up in a Paris prison, but Talien sprang her soon after the ninth of Thermidor. But it was like a revolutionary soap opera. It turned out that she was pregnant. So the wealthy Theresia agreed to marry the lowly Talien, the son of a servant and they named their daughter Thermidor. The lovely Theresia Talien became the fashion queen of Paris. She was called Our Lady of Thermidor. And that winter of 1794-95, coldest winter of the century, she introduced a racy new fashion, a see-through dress. It was actually a diaphanous Greek-style tunic. She wore fancy light sandals on her feet. Talleyrand, the diplomat, quipped, one could not have been more richly unclothed. The fancy salons of Madame Talien and other Thermidorians became the new centers of politics. In a way, they replaced the political clubs of the Radical Revolution. One journalist wrote, quote, What do they do at night at Madame Talien's? They negotiate. In other words, they strategized politics for the convention and the streets. For example, in November 1794, the gilded youth deliberately provoked a brawl in the Paris Jacobin Club. Because of this, the National Convention decided to close down the club. The gilded youth had taken action, but the plan was cooked up in Madame Talien's salon. In fact, Closing the Jacobin Club was only one part of the Thermidorian reaction inside the National Convention. Let's go back into the legislature now and look at the deputies' attack on Jacobin policies. Some left-wing deputies defended radical Jacobin policies, but the mood had changed. Lots of Thermidorians wanted to distance themselves from their Jacobin past and from the terror. 
Carrier, the terrorist of Nantes, was on trial at that very moment. And the gilded youth also shouted conservative things from the galleries. By December 1794, the deputies agreed to reintegrate the former Girondins, the old enemies and rivals of the Jacobins. Here's another part of the Thermidorian reaction. The Jacobins, remember, they created a controlled economy in the effort to win the war and feed the poor. But the Thermidorians chose to dismantle these economic controls. They acted in the name of freeing the economy. They wanted to placate the merchants and satisfy the big peasant producers out in the provinces. So what did the convention do? They fired munitions workers. They closed down public workshops. And then they decided to put an end to price controls. In December 1794, they took a truly drastic step. They did away with the maximum. Remember that the maximum price controls had kept a lid on the price of all kinds of food and necessities. Now, all of a sudden, prices shot up. The harvest of 1794 had been weak. Now the cost of bread skyrocketed. In fact, the price of food and fuel spiraled out of control because at the very same time, runaway inflation made the paper money, the assigna, almost worthless. Each assigna was worth only a fifth, then less than a tenth of its face value. And merchants wanted to accept only hard currency, metal coins. But who had those? Only the rich. By a cruel twist of fate, the winter of 1794-95 was bitter cold, the harshest winter in forever. The Seine froze over. Barges couldn't make their way up the river to bring enough grain and fuel to the capital city. Roads across France were barely passable. Horses froze in their tracks and dropped to the icy ground. Lots of people were trying to scrape by on just three or four ounces of bread a day. It was easier to get rice, but none of the poor had any fuel to cook it. And the city slashed the size of bread rations for the poor. Starvation stalked Paris once again. More people commit suicide in Paris in the winter of 1794-95 than ever before. On the 29th of March, the police arrested a young mother who had killed two of her three children. She said she only had food for one. Take a moment to imagine how the poor of Paris felt when they saw the well-to-do ride by in their carriages to their fancy balls, to the opera, to the theater. Imagine how the shivering people of Paris felt when they heard about parties at the well-heated home of Madame Tallien, where women were wearing nothing but sandals and flimsy gowns. Where was the dream of equality now? The year of the terror and the memory of the Jacobins began to look pretty good. Some sans-culotte women were heard to whisper, when the guillotine worked, we had bread. The people really had no leader, no one like Marat to speak for them now. But there was one diehard left-wing journalist, a man by the name of Gracchus Babeuf. He'd founded a new newspaper called The People's Forum. In The People's Forum, Babeuf demanded, should the people organize an insurrection? Absolutely, if they do not want to lose their liberty forever. Liberty is in its death throes. In February 1795, the police put Babeuf in prison for attempting to stir up insurrection. They shut down his paper, but he'll be back in the next lecture because he left a long legacy. In the meantime, plenty of people agreed with his message. In the cafes and in the galleries of the convention, police spies heard people grumbling. Quote, the convention has pulled down a tyrant in order to become a tyrant itself. It censors the people. Or all the good patriots have been put in prison. The old sans culotte knew that the Thermidorians were trying to put an end to the revolution. So in the streets, people began to talk about the Constitution of 1793. It had a declaration of rights that promised social rights to people, work, 
subsistence, the right to insurrection? Posters showed up on the walls of Paris. One was called The Republican Awakening by a Democratic woman. It called on the people to rise up and demand the Constitution of 1793. The author spoke out against food scarcity, high prices, and bread lines. She denounced the nouveau riche merchants, the gilded youth, and the conservative leaders. On the morning of the first of Prairie Isle of the year three, that would be the 20th of May, 1795, the last great uprising of the French Revolution took place. At about 11 o'clock in the morning, one deputy at the podium was warning the convention about a dangerous new pamphlet that called for an uprising. In the galleries, women were teasing the deputies and shouted the word bread over and over. And right then, a crowd of protesters smashed through the convention door and poured into the assembly. Sans-culotte women were in the lead, just the way they had been at the October Day's March to Versailles back in 1789. And just like that march, this uprising came out of both politics and food. Some women had chalked a slogan on their hats or on their shirts, bread and the Constitution of 1793. They also demanded the release of their patriot husbands. These were sans culottes who had been thrown into prison in the reaction against Jacobin radicals. The crowd got bigger and bigger. More men were joining now. They were egged on by their wives. Police hurried to the scene, but they weren't there in time to save one little known deputy. The rioters thought he was the most prominent Thermidorian leader of the Gilded Youth. He wasn't, and he blocked their way. They knocked him down, shot him, and cut off his head. They put it on a pike. The story goes that the president of the assembly actually tipped his hat at this grisly scene in a gesture of calm contempt. Some hardcore Jacobins jumped up to back the demands of the crowd. These old Jacobins of the mountain seconded the call for price controls and better bread rations. They too demanded the freeing of Patriot prisoners, and above all, they called for the Constitution of 1793. The insurrection and the confusion lasted for three whole days. Some of the sans-culottes raided the munitions workshops and got weapons. But the deputies called in the armed forces, and the gilded youth also mixed it up by fighting against the sans-culottes. This Prairie Isle uprising, it's named after the late spring month of Prairie Isle on the revolutionary calendar. The Prairie Isle uprising was different from earlier, more successful uprisings in Paris, like the storming of the Bastille or the overthrow of the king. This time, the crowd didn't have clear leadership. And there was another big difference. The sans-culotte had very few allies inside the convention. Only a few deputies backed them up. That old revolutionary coalition between the streets and the convention had already grown weaker during the terror. Now that alliance had died for sure. In fact, conservative Thermidorian leaders even arrested six Jacobin deputies who supported the crowd in this Prairie Isle uprising. These six men, prominent Jacobins, they were sentenced to death for plotting insurrection. On the way to the scaffold, one of them took out a knife. Each one then attempted to stab himself in a heroic gesture, revolutionary suicide. They modeled themselves on the ancients of Rome, and they made themselves into martyrs. They wanted to give revolutionary meaning to their own deaths. One of them said, I die innocent, pure, without regret. My sacrifice will yet be useful to liberty. These six men became known as the martyrs of Prairie Isle. They went down in Jacobin history as heroes. And as for the sans-culottes, their uprising backfired. The convention now got super wary of the crowd. Step by step, they passed laws to rein in the people. Women had led the insurrection, so the deputies immediately passed a law that no women could attend the galleries of the convention. And they couldn't even congregate in groups bigger than five. With restrictions like that, how could they gather to do their laundry on the banks of the Seine? Police spies insisted in their reports, 
The women are silent. They have become mute about politics. And the police arrested several thousand suspect Jacobins and sans-culottes, male and female. Hundreds of them were in prison for months without even being accused. Only about 150 faced trial, but 13 sans-culottes leaders were guillotined. The convention also disarmed Jacobins and closed down political clubs in Paris and all across France. Clearly, the convention was steering France to the right. We've been focusing on Paris, but what about the provinces? As the Thermidorian reaction pushed the revolution to the right, in some parts of France, brutal attacks on the Jacobins took place, especially in the south. Here, a veritable second terror broke out. It was called the White Terror. Some opponents of the Jacobins organized into paramilitary groups with names like the Company of Jesus or the Company of the Sun. They wanted to exact revenge on Jacobins. You can tell from the name White Terror that they had royalist leanings. But these anti-Jacobins anti engaged more in vendetta than in politics or a political movement. They created an ugly campaign of intimidation, assassination, and in a few cases, bloody massacres of Jacobins. In Marseille that June, for example, about 40 young men stormed into the prison. They blew off the cell doors with cannon and killed over 100 Jacobins. Clearly, it was very hard for France to find a way out of the violence that had produced the terror. As France lurched to the right, royalists and counter-revolutionaries got their hopes up. At the very least, maybe France would be able to go back to a constitutional monarchy where the legislature could share power with the king. After all, the king, the would-be king, was just a little boy, 10-year-old Louis, in prison in Paris. But then in June 1795, little Louis XVII died in prison. Ironically, he died from scrofula, the tubercular skin disease that the king's touch could cure. His death put an end to any easy royalist fantasies. But some people claimed the boy hadn't really died. My favorite pretender story has him popping up in Green Bay, Wisconsin in the early 19th century. But back to 1795. Louis XVI's brother, the Count of Provence, leader of the emigres, he immediately proclaimed himself Louis XVIII. From exile in northern Italy, he issued a declaration promising to restore the old regime. He vowed he'd bring back the absolute power of the king, the privileges of the nobility, the full grandeur of the Catholic Church. He acted as though the revolution of 1789 had never happened. By doing that, he basically ruled out any possibility of becoming a constitutional monarch. If he'd tried, it probably would have unleashed civil war in France anyway. But the key point is, his intransigence was a warning. The Thermidorians didn't want to allow any resurgence of royalism. Now, speaking of royalism, at about this same time, France heard a scary piece of news. On the southern coast of Brittany, the British Navy had landed several thousand troops of French emigres. These royalists were trying to join up with counter-revolutionary guerrilla forces in Brittany. The Republican army was already in the area. They were trying to repress counter-revolutionary guerrillas. Within two weeks, the Republican forces had succeeded in putting down this emigre invasion, and they executed some 750 men. But despite its failure, this royalist landing sent a kind of shiver of fear up the spine of the revolutionaries in France, including those Thermidorian leaders in the convention. And to make things worse, the counter-revolutionaries were organizing again in the irrepressible Vendée. Let's step back for a moment and look at things from the viewpoint of the Thermidorian leaders in the convention. How could they bring stability to France? From their point of view, they were definitely worried about popular politics and agitation in the streets of Paris. But at the same time, they feared royalism. So the Thermidorian leaders chose to act with pragmatism and realism. 
They tried to come up with a moderate plan that would win the support of men of property, merchants, big farmers, middle-class men, men who supported the revolution but didn't need its most egalitarian dreams. That summer, a deputy by the name of Boissy d'Anglas rose to prominence. He had a new vision. He was chair of the Constitutional Committee. During the terror, he hadn't been a very prominent deputy. But now, in this Thermidorian climate, he came into his own. He led the charge against Jacobin economic policies like the Maximum. The people of Paris called him Boissy Famine instead of Boissy d'Anglas. He dared to say what many French people with property wanted to hear. Quote, absolute equality is a chimera. We should be governed by the best among us. By the best among us, he made clear that he meant well-educated men, law-abiding men. Above all, men who had a stake in the republic because they owned property. He put it bluntly, we have to safeguard the property of the rich. Boissy d'Anglas urged his fellow deputies to let go of their unrealistic dreams of social or political equality. Civil and legal equality, that was enough. He warned against giving political rights to men without property. He claimed that their taxes and their social policies would be disastrous for commerce and agriculture. And he said, if you give men without property political rights without reservations, they will precipitate us into violent convulsions like those from which we are barely recovering. In other words, he scared France with a possible return to the terror. Thermidorian leaders decided that they would sacrifice a little of France's precious new equality. They'd pursue stability and social order instead. Under Boissy's guidance, the convention wrote a new constitution for the third time in four years. This constitution of 1795 took a distinctly conservative turn. It declared that all adult men had voting rights, but real power, true power, lay in the hands of the electors. These electors would attend electoral colleges and they'd choose the deputies. Only the richest ta taxpayers could become electors, some 30,000 men in all of France, 28 million people. In its Declaration of Rights, this new constitution abandoned promises of social rights, and the deputies added a declaration of duties that urged people to respect the law, property, and family. The Constitution of 1795 also set up a bicameral legislature for the first time in France. The deputies were hoping to introduce greater stability. They mandated, for example, that the 250 representatives on the Council of Elders had to be married or widowed, and they had to be over 40 years old. Finally, the Constitution set up an executive of five men called directors. They'd be chosen by the Council of Elders. The deputies were wary of letting any single man hold executive power, so they created a weak executive. Voters across France approved the Constitution by a huge margin, but far fewer men voted than in 1793, and some protested the new order. Listen to the voters in Limoges. We are deeply disturbed to see the rich supplanting all other categories of citizens. In the 19th and 20th centuries, the French and their historians wrestled with the question of how to interpret and understand the Thermidorian reaction. Had the Thermidorians betrayed the revolution? And revolutionaries in other places later on feared that they would repeat Thermidor and lose the fire of revolution. The Russian revolutionaries were haunted by the specter of Thermidor, haunted by the possibility of slowing down or even betraying the revolution. But one historian of Thermidor has pointed out that all revolutionaries fear Thermidor, not so much because the Thermidorians somehow betrayed or destroyed the revolution. What the Thermidorians did was acknowledge that revolution had grown older, that it carried the baggage of its own past. Revolutions get their power from the myth of eternal youth, 
the eternal present, the myth of creating the new by destroying the old. But the Thermidorians recognized that the revolution had aged. It somehow needed to stop. After the terror, they were tired. As one deputy said, we've done the work of six centuries in six years. Ending a revolution is hard. Every revolution through history seems to struggle with that moment. How to return to ordinary life and peaceful politics after the initial revolutionary enthusiasm has worn off. In the next lecture, we'll watch the revolutionaries try out their fixed up republic. The new government created by the Constitution of 1795 was called the Directory. We'll ask how the Directory tried to end the revolution and fulfill its promises as best they could.